And we are back. <laughs> While well, you're recutting the scenery. <clears throat> okay. So after that unfortunate break in immersion, we are back with the discussion. Now we've moved through pretty much all we are going to say about immersion, quite a bit about acting and how it connects to role playing. My guest uh, in this suddenly two part hangout is Lorne long-term role player, long-term friend. And we had just decided to move into the part about technique. <clears throat> Sorry, and I'm losing my voice, making this all the much more fun. Technique. We were saying that in our group, which is made up of uh, a small core group that had remained consistent for a long period, seven, eight years, and a, a group of people who would attach to that group for a period of time while they were in the country. Um, we didn't really discuss technique overtly. Whoever was running the game would try something. And sometimes uh, some of the more common game masters, uh, people who would uh, run the game more frequently, would get together to collaborate on different techniques that we wanted to try. Uh, one notable one was a generation game where we went through uh, White Wolf's Adventure, Aberrant, and Trinity games um, with a, a very long uh, kind of meta plot uh, planned out and lots of surprises in store for the, the characters people had had created. It was it had some very heavy narrative touches to it. And my experiment at that time was seeing just how open-ended, how uh, simulationist I could get within that very heavy narrative framework. And it was, it was an interesting experiment for me. One of the other experiments that was going on in that same game was to very consistently refer to the characters uh, from the Game Master's chair uh, by their names. Uh, where I would normally just say you and leave it uh, leave it be ambiguous so I could be referring to you as the character or I could be referring to you as as you the player and uh, and seeing how that worked by actually using character names from from behind the screen what kind of impact did it have on play and this was a technique that I didn't discuss with the players, ever. Do you remember? I prefer that because I mean I don't mind being called you, and I assume because once we're into a game, I'm just going to be that character and being that person while we're sitting in the room. So if you say you and you look at me with the um, like, what do we call them, the dead lizard eyes of the DM? <laughs> That's so me, flattering. There you go. When you give me that look and say you see this. I assume you're, you're talking about the character people, because clearly I don't see it in my head. Um, and sometimes when you throw names in, it makes it easier to differentiate who you're talking about. Because um, I'm looking down at my sheet and trying to figure out you know, whether or not I can pull this off. And you do this. Well, that's me. Ah, I, I, prefer, I, prefer, I prefer names to be used, and us, I prefer to be directly addressed as my character. Either in the second person or by name. Okay. So now how about when you're speaking with other players? Assuming in dialogue between characters. Dialogue between characters, and assuming we haven't gone tangentially off into some other strange thing to talk about, which happens far too often, then I, I'm, I'm addressing that person, I'm addressing the person I see in my head as that character. Now, it may not necessarily be that 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 person, the role player, player. You know what I mean? I, I'd be looking, for example, a guy named John. I'm looking at. I'm not looking at John. I'm looking at whatever John's character is, and seeing that, and talking to that. And some people do this to different degrees. Some people get further into it than others. Some people very, in my experience from our group, especially people that came in and out, never could never separate their voice their real voice from their character's voice. So 
when they would answer, sometimes I didn't know whether this was the character answering or the player answering. <laughs> is that you, or is that you? Is that you, or is that you? <laughs> right. And so that, that, that was a bit frustrating for me, but that's just because I... I think it's, maybe it's, just, maybe it's just a mental exercise that an actor is easier to jump into. I'm going to be somebody else right now. Go and be somebody else. And you can think like somebody else and act like somebody else and speak like somebody else because that's what you practice doing. But isn't that like like any skill? Yeah, it's just practice. It's, just, it's a muscle. Yeah. Because I, I, you know, I'm just drawing a martial arts analogy, there are a lot of things that, that uh, you know, the, the, the white belt thinks is impossible. I'm never going to be able to do that. That, uh, you know, just a few months later uh, are becoming routine. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's no, there's, I would never ever try and suggest that unless you're an actor, you can't do this. No, it's just practice. You just have to no, practice. I mean that, that practice... That practice is either done or it's not done, and you'll benefit from practice or you'll <laughs> reap the results of not practicing. <laughs> well, there's that. I mean, there's, I mean, I've, I've played with people who refer to their character consistently by the character's name. Um, uh, character's name is Roland. Dave. Roland. Okay. Roland opens the door, and I, it, it, it takes me out of the game when that happens. Because it's like, well, who? I, I want to hear you say, I open the door, so I can hear in your voice who you are and what you're saying, what you get a feeling for. Are you scared opening the door? Are you happy opening the door? Like, I open the door. I'll say that it's more, you open the door. But I, I, it helps me have a picture of who I'm dealing with. So that I, in my own head, if I close my eyes for a second during the game, I can look over here and see Roland, who is this red headed barbarian. Um, whatever. Stepchild. Stepchild, and over here is going to be the scrawny little wizard who's a loud mouth little jerk who's going to get slapped if he tries to start, doesn't smarten up. And it's like the pictures that I can make in my head, not not based on the players, but based on what they describe themselves as and how they talk and how they act. But as soon as people start talking, Roland does this. It's like it, it, to me, it feels like a cheat. You're not you're not investing yourself in it. Okay, so let's let's explore that a little bit. You definitely want first-person dialogue. I prefer that, yes. But you also want first-person clarification of details which cannot be presented because of the fact that we're sitting around a table. You want first-person explication of action, mood, thought. Roland opens the door with a frown on his face. Or do you want the character to say, Roland, I, I open the door and actually have a frown on their face? Or do you want them to, you know? Well, what I want other people to do is is limited, I guess, to what I, I expect other people can do based on experience. But for myself, if I'm doing it, I would, quite often I would say, if I'm Roland and there's a door in front of me, we've been walking down a long, creepy, creepy dark hallway. We've all got our creepy dark hallway image in our head, and there's a door at the end. And we have no other direction to go but through that door. And now Roland, maybe Lorne, or maybe Roland, both have a feeling that behind that door is a really big ugly ogre who's going to start beating on us pretty quickly. And I would probably, I, I would probably make a couple jokes. I might make a couple jokes as Lorne in my normal voice about something, and then, but then, I, as Roland, I'd be like, well, I mean, I'm I'm pretty convinced there's something really nasty behind this door, but that's the only way to go. We have to go through that door, so all right, I'm going to open it up carefully. And I would give out certain, and I mean, I, I just even I just look at myself in the video as I'm saying that that expression. I think was fairly clear in my face. Oh, and if we're going to go, this is going to happen. Because that's just the way I emote. And some people don't do that. Some people prefer to separate themselves from it. And distance themselves from it, which I think is kind of it's, to me, it's, it's you're not you're not getting the fun of it. That's the whole point. Okay, so for you, one of the primary points then immersion in character. Yes. 
That's the whole point of role playing. You're playing a role. Okay. And. I mean, I've, I've played role characters on stage, like I'm doing now, specifically, um, and I've played in games with you who do things that I personally would never do. <laughs> well, I certainly hope that's the truth. <laughs> and rather dark superhero comes to mind. But anyway, <clears throat> it calls up the summons up a thousand souls of dead babies. And, and <laughs> that was one of my favorite scenes ever. <laughs> it's pretty bad. Um, that's what you get for giving me too much power. Um, you know, the stuff that I would never do, but it's fun to do that in character and in the role-playing situation. And I know that some people can't do that. Some people have a really hard time with going across their own moral threshold. Well, we gamed with one for years, right? So, yeah. right. You got really, and really angry at me because I was going to drive a knife through this giant crocodile thing that was blocking our path and was attacking us. We had it at its mercy. I was going to kill it so we could continue on. And he kept saying, well, what if it's mother and has children? I said, don't fucking care. It's a fucking crocodile monster. Kill it. And <laughs> now, in reality, I would probably try and avoid killing the crocodile monster if I found myself on an alien world trapped and stranded. <laughs> we, have to, we have to quantify the... Uh, yeah. No, that's true. I mean, because now we're getting into a, a different area. I mean, okay, sorry. the... The influence of the player on the character is pretty much expected. You've created the character. So as a role player, you should have some say in what it, what it does. But uh, the reciprocal response... I disagree with that. From an actual point of view, um, you, you do what the character does. You don't, the, the real person doesn't necessarily affect what the character does. I mean, sure. then we would never have psychos in a movie. We'd never have bad guys in movies. Right. <laughs> Sorry. So, so there's the, the in-character, or the, the adoption of the character, but depending on the amount of freedom you have in the game world, most people at some point will butt up against a principle or a moral or whatever that they're not willing to cross even though the character would. Right. Can I, can I, make, can I make one very memorable mention? Please. We were doing a, a pretty Palladian game when um, my, my wizard character was tasked with going in and, and clearing out a, a, hive of, of, you know, a hive of kobolds. And just as we started this, you sort of casually brought up the idea that you realize that this character is going into these otherwise unsuspecting innocent kobolds' homes and just slaughtering all of them and stealing all their stuff. I thought it was <laughs> an appropriate thing to mention to a good character. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I mean, I granted the kobolds weren't necessarily good. They were hijacked. They were... They were, they were kidnapping people and doing terrible things, but I mean, you're going in there with the full intention of killing all of them and taking their stuff. Just... <laughs> I don't remember the taking the stuff part, but I do remember that most of the people that you met were women and children. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a perfect example, right? You, Lorne, would never do that as a human being. No. But... Uh, as Marlon... Marlon Tyrell had Marlon. no qualms about going in there and, and taking care of the kobold threat uh, in diapers. And uh, so this was a line that was easy to cross. And during that whole session, um, this was uh, a play by email game. right? So it was very easy to have. This was very easy to have I. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, the actual battle took place face-to-face, uh, -face, right. but uh, the, uh, the preceding scenes and the decision to go in and, and kill them all and let the gods sort them out, uh, that took place in email. And this was all in the first person. Right. And naturally, the game continued in the first person. But do you find that when you come up close to one of those lines, one of those moral barriers, or just 
a barrier of personal disgust or discomfort do you find that you shift out of the first person into a different voice? No, I, I don't. I, I, I think um, in my normal, my, my voice, capital M-Y, my voice, if I approach a moral line that I, I'm not comfortable with, then if I'm playing a character, then that doesn't really matter except that it triggers for me the idea of how would this character deal with the situation. A case in point, the play that I'm practicing right now, we just started rehearsals last week, it's called Race, and it's about a white lawyer, me, and a black lawyer, Ellie, who are defending a very rich white man who's accused of raping a black woman. So the whole play is called Race, and that's all about race. And I'm not, I don't consider myself to be racist at all. I do have Does anybody? Have <laughs> again, one of the issues that people are racist but don't realize that. Um, and I, I think that's true. But I do have to throw the N-word around in this play. And, um, and I'm throwing it around to um, a respected colleague and a younger female paralegal. And I'm throwing it around at them. And it's, I mean, I would never do that. I don't use that particular word. I don't, I don't think it should be used in a certain way. Company, personally, uh, but I can understand why my character was doing it in that situation, and it made sense for that character to do that. Um, and it made me physically uncomfortable afterwards, after rehearsals from that. Um, I was really, really, really upset about it. Um, and I have to get past that. that. But my character wouldn't have a problem doing that because that's the way he is. And, and again, it's still very early days in that process, so I'm still making up who that character is, but. Because the lines are set in the play, I have to say these lines. I have to find a way to justify these lines. With right. Picking it up as a character. So moral lines, moral dilemmas. Um, if it's something that makes me uncomfortable as Lauren, I wonder then immediately if I'm in a role playing situation or an acting situation, how would this character react to it? And. Um, and, oh, I wish I could. I wish I could recall his name right now. I wish I could recall his name. In the in the heat of a battle and the heat of, of combat, just summoning up the souls of ten thousand dead children to eat your flesh. <laughs> well, he had <laughs> he had a bunch of names, but yes, oh, your South African mercenary. South African mercenary superhero. Johan was Johan Johan something. Right. Uh, his superhero name I forgot now. Anyway, but his superhero name is because it was, it was an appropriate thing for him to do to call up the souls of 10,000 dead children and make them eat you. Um, it, Very appropriate. It made sense for him to do that. Yeah. So I, I, I find if, if, if people are letting their real life interfere with the game, whether it's checking your text messages all the time or being aware of the phone or too much tangential conversation about Monty Python or whatever. Um, it does take away from the experience, and we have a limited time. And so I would prefer to do, as, I would prefer to stay in character as much as possible, but I mean, obviously, we go off on tangents. And once we started playing with tablets, for example, and tablet computers, we would end up spending far too much time comparing tablets and talking about technology. <laughs> Very true. Yes, of course, that was also in a coffee shop. <clears throat> this was loud. Lots of, lots of distractions. Um, yeah, if... If the game is the goal, if, you're, if you've gathered together not just to socialize and have fun, but you've gathered together to advance the characters through the situation, then, then definitely um, things that don't serve that goal are, are a distraction. But to, to finish off the point, one thing that I noticed as these choices, these difficult choices or these moral lines were being offered as choices to the players, that... The, the culture of our group was first-person role-play, was, was in-character role-play rather than third-person uh, in-scene or in-story role-play. So each person in the group was referring to themselves, or each person in the core part of our group was referring to themselves or their character as I or doing everything in the first person. But when these very difficult, very ugly situations came up, play would stop and there would be a moment of characters 
or sorry, players choosing to vent their own emotion or their commentary about the choice and then would proceed. Uh, there's a moment of of the, the, the player needing to stop the action. Say, wow, this is dark. And then play would continue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that definitely happens. Uh, I, I mean, I would prefer it didn't happen, but it does. Uh, I'm guilty of it myself, certainly. Um, so this can never happen on stage. You can't go, wow, that was an excellent delivery of that line. Absolutely not. Um, especially not, especially not in, in a scripted play. And certain scripted plays are like that. They're, they're designed to be like that. But, um, no, you can't. Cer certain plays will allow for a, a certain amount of ad libs, but breaking down the fourth wall completely and stepping out of character is 99.999% of the time completely inappropriate. Um, and in an improv situation, completely inappropriate. Um, somebody says something really funny and they make a callback to something from two minutes before. And it's really, really funny. The audience is killing themselves laughing. Everyone's having a great time. It's really funny. You can't laugh. Or if you're going to laugh, you have to at least laugh in character and have a reason for this to be funny. If you, right. you, can't, you can't break character. Um, so here's, here's my question, <clears throat> if I can get it out one second while I have a sip of my tasty beverage. Cheers. <clears throat> Thank you. I bet you my beverage is tastier than your beverage. I was about to say my beverage is tastier than yours, except I had my beverage in my mouth at that moment. I timed it that way. Nice. So, here's my question. You have said a couple of times in this segment about narrative voice and, and being in the story, being in character, that you would prefer, so this is your personal goal, you would prefer to stay in character as much as possible. Except when I want to go have a cigarette, in which case we have to break character and go outside. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so this is a, a personal goal. It's also a goal of mine. And yet, or not and yet, and on stage, you can't break character to do other things. You have to maintain the scene integrity uh, come hell or high water. You can't in the park, you cannot go to the bathroom, you cannot go have a cigarette. If your mouth is dry, deal with it. You cannot get a glass of water unless you can find an excuse to get one on stage appropriately. Right. So in a in a game, how disruptive is it? I mean, we're all just there for fun. I mean, we're not there to, to work or get paid as actors. But if everybody around the table wants that same thing, wants that totally in character or or to, to minimize out of character moments to the to the maximum degree, how hard is it? I would, well, at first you have to would have to establish that everyone wants to do that. Um, so if you did, okay. Well, well I'm thinking it's, it's, it's when we're gaming with people that we've just met, like the the last incarnation of our gaming group involves. Um, you, me, and three people who are generally new to this. One of yes. whom we immediately connected with, two of whom not so much. And one immediately dropped away in, in, to this. And uh, I think there was a certain amount of uncomfortableness in how much you are going to reveal of yourself. Like, now, again, like you're talking about having fun, it's not work. That's If there's any work involved in acting, it's not breaking character. When something goes wrong, or something's really funny, or something's a little bit different, that's the work involved as far as I'm concerned. The rest of it is just fun. Um, but as, as far as a performance goes, you cannot break character. Now, that means you have to choose to not do that at all. You can't do that. I, I, well, you have to choose to not do that, because if you do it, you're fired. <laughs> oh God, no! I haven't been off the stage. Sorry, the director comes out and apologizes to everybody. Here's your money back. And go um, but I'm looking. I'm thinking back to um, some of the people that we were working with recently. When an uncomfortable situation comes up, and we, I don't necessarily know these people that well. Here, okay, put it this way: when you and I were gaming together, and someone else was the storyteller. Yes. I believe there were many fewer instances of breaking, going out of character and talking about something outside the game or about the game. 
I think we stayed in character more often together because I'm comfortable with you, and I, you know that I can. I know that I can say things that my character is going to do or say or react or do. And and I'm not going to hold you responsible for what <laughs> your character said or did. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I think there's a certain trust involved in that. With whereas there isn't that that level of trust with people that we've just met or just met recently. So that you sort of step out of. I mean, if 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 I'm if I'm going into a um, Anakin Skywalker kill all the people in the Jedi Temple kind of moment, and I just go in there and do it because that's what my character's going to do. The other people around me who don't know me at all, there's a part of my head going, well, as long as you understand this is acting, we're goofing this, we're having fun, this is not real. Yeah. And some of those people would have a really hard time with that. And they, they might need time to think both for themselves as a person and as a character, well, how's my character going to deal with that? I don't really know who my character is enough yet to know how he would deal with that. So let's take it out of the game for a second and process on the back burner how my character's going to deal with the situation. I would mm -hmm. prefer not to do that, but then again, that takes that's, that takes a certain amount of commitment. Takes a certain amount of commitment. So, in rehearsal, let's say for a play with a a, a similarly sized cast of of characters on stage that you'd find in a role playing game. Mm -hmm. During the process of rehearsal to produce a performance, how long does it take before people stop interrupting, asking questions, uh, or you know, breaking that, character? That depends on a couple of different variables. It depends on how long the rehearsal process is in its entirety. If you only have three weeks and you don't spend a lot of time doing that, if you have six, seven weeks or two months, then you have more time to explore this and stop and say, now why? Well, why am I doing this? Why am I walking over here? What? I'm not really sure what this line means. Like, why am I saying this? That sort of thing. And also, I mean, when the last play I just did, um, there was one, the, the woman who was playing my soon-to-be ex-wife was upstage to the right of me, and she, she had very few lines in this one particular section, but she was being referred to a lot in, in very negative ways, and she was just reacting to it all the time. And at one point late in the rehearsals, we're completely off book, we're running the play, we're not supposed to be stopping for anything, just running through, and the director's going to give us notes afterwards and what he would like to change. And we're running through it, running through it, and I, for one particular reason, decided to turn and saw her, and saw for the first time the faces she was making as, as people who were saying these terrible things about her. And I just fell on the floor laughing. It was hilarious. And I had to get that out of the way so that, okay, the next rehearsal was like, no, don't look at her. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> Make sure you do not look at her during this because I'll start laughing. And during performance, I made the mistake once of catching her and look and catching her eye as this was happening. Went, it was, <laughs> but you're, by that point, the adrenaline is playing and you're pumped up and you're focused. So it was just a moment of, oh, not going to laugh. And she saw, there was one moment we both completely stepped out of character and looked, and, and it was me looking at Lauren. And we're both going, she <laughs> almost made me laugh. I see you almost made me laugh. And she knew that I almost laughed, and she almost laughed for just for a split second, and then we're back into it and continued on. So how does or how can any of that discipline translate into trying to, let's say, elevate or how to control the atmosphere of the game that you're in? I for example, setting a goal around the table that we will not break character. Some people are just going to rebel against that completely. Some people um, are really going to rebel against that. Um, most of the ger geeks, I don't know why I was going to say that. Most of the geeks and nerds that I know in the role-playing world, and I consider myself both a geek and a nerd, um, have a tendency to want to show off a little bit about something. Whether it tends to be quick comebacks, whether it's... If they, there's a there's a there's a, a culture around role playing when you're sitting on a table with a bunch of people playing a game to see who can make the funniest snap comment. And sometimes those comments are in character, many times they're not. And if you're gonna impose a rule that we're only gonna be speaking in character, that's gonna make a lot of people automatically really uncomfortable because it's not their area to make that little joke. And that's what a lot of people want to do in those situations, I find personally. Um, you know, even you watch tabletop, for example, or or, or role-playing games like that that are that are filmed and put on YouTube, and you watch some of those things that you do. Um, 
there's always there's, there's always, there's always people making comments that are out of character, that are meta to the game, that are funny, because they would have a good time, and there's always one or two of those people who just can't do that but keep trying. Those are the people that will never want to stay in character the whole time. And forcing them to do so would make them so uncomfortable they would probably quit. I imagine. Right, well, I would never support force <laughs> in the hobby. Anyway, that's, your that's my problem. I need to start <laughs> start being forceful. You guys are all going to play my way or your... This is how we're going to do it. <laughs> no. So, I guess what I'm getting at is in, the, in an environment where consensus was reached, like, for example, people heard about gaming entirely in the third person, or gaming with description in the third person but dialogue in the first person, and they wanted to try it to see what kind of effect it would have on their imagination or their level of immersion or their level of investment. Okay, yeah, if, you do, if you do it as an experiment, okay, we're gonna, I'd like to run this game completely in the third person. Fine, that would, I'd be fine with that. That's, that's true. As an experiment, that would be a lot of fun to see how it's different. I so how? Entirely in the first person. You can only refer to yourself as your character, only speak as your character, or only right. speak as yourself about your character. So those would be two very different experiences. I think that would be fun to do. You establish that as a rule up front. Right. So... But limiting the, the complete out of character commentary is hard. Well, that that is my point. How long do you think it would take to get a group of, of friends who know each other, who are relatively comfortable, to go from the decision to do this in session one of a game to actually doing it without it being a barrier to immersion, investment, or uh, just the, the normal level of enjoyment of, of play. I would like to think that if you have a fairly close group of friends who are playing together, not necessarily acquaintances, but friends, people who are actually friendly to each other, know each other, know each other's, you know, clothes and foibles and, foibles and stuff like that, then if you set up, so we're going to do this as an experiment, this way, no out-of-character talk, then let's only do it as first person speaking, or let's only do it as third person speaking, no out of character talk, keep it to as, as much of a minimum as possible, and if you're friends, when someone goes, oh yeah, you know, yesterday I saw this guy, you go, hey, no. Oh yeah, 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 okay, great. okay back to this. And so so if you, if you have people you trust you can do that with, that's fine, I don't see that being a problem. I would like to think that the people I trust you to play with could handle those rules. How long do you think it would take before the practice effect made it easy. It shouldn't take more than a session or two, I would imagine. Okay. I mean, if, if it's a valuable experience, if people find it really uncomfortable to not be able to meta-talk about the game, and it also assuming you have a game where you don't need to discuss rules, because uh, that'll always take you out. Right, you have to know the game. That's, yeah, that's, that's given. Uh, a given, that's foundation to the to the ability to experiment. If there's no need to discuss rules or to allow cons consultation of the chart to take you out of what you're going to do, then I shouldn't take very long for a group of experienced people who know each other and trust each other to do that and stay in character in whatever voice you want to give them. I don't see that being a problem at all. Okay. I think, I think it would be fun to do. I think most people would realize it's fun to do when you take that aspect out of it. I think it's when people are not as comfortable with each other that you have to resort to your own personality or whatever personality you choose to put in front of other people. <laughs> I'm, I'm role-playing an acceptable role-player in this new group I've just met. When you're playing games. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Yes, sadly. <laughs> And so, I'm almost out of voice, and uh, I just want to thank you for joining me this evening to discuss about these concepts, and I'm looking forward to checking out the, the comments, which may or may not be cropping up around part one and, and uh, part two, and uh, do you have anything to say before we go? You did, didn't you? You just said discuss about this. I may have, but I'm sick, so you can cut me a little slack. All right, all right, all right. Hope you're frozen. <laughs>